Hi students, this is Mrs. T. This is part two of lesson two for week nine that we're doing together. Um, I'm going to show you a portion of an HBO documentary, just about 10-15 minute segment that I've clipped out of a documentary um, today to give you an example of the style of life, the standard of living that members of the underclass in the United States experience. So the people that you're going to meet in this video, the, first of all, the name of this longer video, which you can find in my Anthropology Teacher playlist, is called Lolly's Kin, The Legacy of Cotton. And this person right here that you're about to see climb into her house trailer um, is Lolly, and she's going to tell you a little bit about herself, tell you a little bit about her living style. You're going to hear from members of her family. You're going to hear from teachers and principals at the school that teaches kids like the ones Lolly cares for daily and people from her neighborhood's kids. Um, so you're going to see some examples of the kinds of hurdles, the kind of obstacles, the, the lack of life chances that some members of the underclass and the working poor in the United States have or don't have, I guess is the best way to, to say that sentence. Anyway, so um, by now you have in your notes a lot of information about life chances and the two-part definition that we need in order to be able to do really, really well on Project 2 and ACE Test 3 also. Uh, so keep your notes open. And you've also got some notes about the different kinds of poverty. And I want you to look at those definitions of the different types of poverty that you have in your notes. Don't just look in your textbook for those definitions because remember, we go into them more in depth in class when you're taking notes. So make sure that you have really good notes from previous recordings from week nine that talks about absolute poverty, relative poverty, and subjective poverty. And tell me or try to decide whether this family lives in absolute, relative, or subjective poverty according to the definitions. So you make up that, that decision yourself when you look at those definitions for those terms and then also evaluate what you're seeing in this movie. So let me go ahead and play some of it for you. I'll stop it from time to time to make comments. Like for instance, I'm going to do some review while we're watching this about the socialization process, which is a lifelong learning process where through the interaction that we have with others, we learn attitudes, ideas, behaviors, conditions that we carry with us through our adulthood that affects our daily behavior into our senior years even. Like, like Lolly is in her 60s in this, in this video, but the young kids are learning from her and her interactions with them, and they'll take that with them into adulthood. So, um, so let's watch a little bit of the movie, and I'll stop it as infrequently as I can, uh, but I do want to point out some things to you during this so you'll see me again, uh, or you'll hear from me again uh, soon.
Okay, so here's one of those points where I want to stop it really quick and review what we just saw. We saw a cute little kid who's about to start going to school, and uh, he's kind of showing off for the camera maybe uh, when he says he wants to go to jail. But remember the socialization process. We learn from the interaction that we have with those we are around every day. And how did Lolly react about school versus jail when he made that joke? She laughed and she accepted it as a joke. She had an opportunity to say, don't let me ever hear you say that again. You're never going to jail. You get that out of your mind. You're going to do well in school. She had an opportunity to say that to him. Maybe a little sweeter than I just acted it out uh, for, for you just now. But she had an opportunity to redirect his line of thinking and explain to him that there was a different outcome that she expected for his life than jail. Um, jail is going to be a major issue in this documentary. Um, you're not going to see very many adult males in the home life situation. And you're even going to see toward the end of this clip that I've selected for you, the kids after bath time are having a little, you know, few minutes of play time after their baths and they're playing, calling the penitentiary on the cell phone. That's the game that they come up with on their shoe phones or whatever it is that they're using uh, to, to play like their phones. Um, so we need to pay attention to that and that will help us understand how we can learn things really early on in life that we carry with us through adulthood and so we can repeat a lot of the patterns that we maybe didn't, you know, don't like as outsiders to see those patterns repeated, but you don't know. You don't you aren't born with a meter in your brain or in your heart or in your soul or whatever you want to say uh, to tell you to be a warning about this is a bad pattern that can keep you oppressed or can keep you downtrodden or can prevent you from achieving the American dream, for instance. So let's watch another little bit of the video now and uh, get some more examples of the kind of life that this, the kind of lifestyle that uh, underclass in the USA live.
So let me pause it again really quick because I have a lot of strong reactions typically from students after they see uh, Lolly's daughters right there playing spades together. Um, they, I get reaction paper comments like, why don't they have a job? Well, uh, look back at the definition of underclass in your notes from last week. Underclass people have seasonal jobs, like you heard um, Lolly's daughter there say during harvest season she has a job at the gin. So at the cotton gin, she can work without really having to have any kind of special literacy skills. So she is not at the education level necessary in order to be able to get a full-time job doing something else. She can't work on a phone bank answering phone calls because usually customer service agencies want someone to have a different level of English skills, spoken and, and comprehension, uh, oral comprehension skills than she probably possesses. Perhaps she can't fill out the application well enough so she can do seasonal labor and the rest of the time you heard her say she's on SSI probably because she was labeled early on in kindergarten as being a resource or special ed like she referred um, to herself. And so if you're uh, labeled special ed and you're put into that curriculum track, there's really not any kind of way that you can get out of it. And often in kindergarten, when students are placed in that curriculum track, it's not because their brain did not have the same aptitude that any other little child's brain has. It's usually about their upbringing to the point where they get to kindergarten. Because did, did your caregiver have literacy skills enough to read you a bedtime story? Did your caregiver have literacy skills and education skills enough to teach you the ABC song or teach you your colors or your shapes? Did you have toys in your house or electricity so that after sundown you had some playtime? Did you have TV, which you can learn a lot from? Well, if you don't have electricity, you probably don't have TV. So there's a whole lot of um, issues. There's a whole lot of problems with um, children from underclass homes being able to achieve higher levels of education that can get them out of that underclass. There are some obstacles there that might be un unpassable uh, on your way to the American dream for most. Remember, sociology is about trends across the board and not isolated um, circumstances where someone beats the odds. Sociology is about the odds. And so you're seeing examples here of the style of life of people in the underclass and their educational attainment is stunted by the socialization process that they experience. Let's watch more. So we have these kids sitting around listening to her commentary and she's not exactly talking to them. But do you think that those little boys have heard before from somebody, if it wasn't Lolly, another woman in their life, uh, do you think they've heard where men ain't no good, men a whole lot of trouble, I don't want no man in my life? What's that little boy supposed to be when he grows up? A no good man that nobody wants around? Those kinds of messages make a lot of difference in a child's self-identity, a child's concept of self growing up. 
Remember, the socialization process is about how do you form self-identity. Well, these boys are sitting around hearing this kind of stuff. I promise you it's not an isolated example for the, for the um, camera. These boys hear that, and it becomes, at least in part, uh, uh, the fabric of their social identity and their self-concept. The girls hear it, too. The girls hear that they can't count on a man and that, you know, men won't come through for you if you do get married or if you do consider that. And so it has an effect on both the boys and the girls' socialization process, their outlook on life, their attitudes, their ideas, their behaviors, and their self-identity. Let's watch more. So yes, that principal did just tell you that he gets kids in kindergarten who don't know their names. So think about how Granny got her name. So if your entire upbringing, the only thing that anybody's ever called you since before you could remember is Granny, then when the kindergarten teacher asks you what's your name and you say Granny, that's not what's on her roster. And if you're unaware that your name is Cassandra Wallace, which is what Granny's real name is, but you're not able to tell your kindergarten teacher that that's what your name is, then here's one of the ways that you're labeled as deficient and might be put into resource or put into special ed. Also, kids on the first day of kindergarten don't know their colors. They can't count. They don't know their letters. They certainly don't know a phone number, a contact number for their parents when there's probably not a phone in the house or a cell phone number that stays constant for any adult in their life who takes care of them. So this is an issue. Socialization is a huge issue for underclass people, for working class, uh, working poor people. You learn your way of life and it's harder to overcome that and achieve upward mobility in the American dream, that concept that we've revisited so often this semester. Let's watch the rest of this.
And there's the end of the segment that I cut for you all to watch. You can watch the whole documentary in my playlist if you would like. Um, it's got a whole lot more examples and gives you some background. I think I started this 10, 15 minutes into the documentary and we're stopping it 10 or 15 minutes after that point where I started it. Um, Red Man is five years old. He's about to go into kindergarten. He doesn't know his real name. He doesn't know his colors or his shapes. He can't count to 10, let alone 100. He probably can't sing the ABC song, although he did sing some spirituals with his grandmother at the very beginning of the video segment that we watched. But he does know the word penitentiary because he has used that uh, on in, during his playtime after his bath to get him all ready for school the next day. So this is an example of a family who is our neighbor right across the Arkansas, the, the Mississippi River in Mississippi. Um, they're in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. It is historically the most impoverished county in the United States. Census after census after census, every decade since we began taking records in the United States, Tallahatchie County is the most impoverished county in the nation. And so this is the kind of poverty, uh, this is one of the kinds of poverty that we have in the United States, and I challenge you to decide what kind of poverty you're looking at by looking at your notes from absolute relative and subjective poverty. And next time we see each other, you will be getting an example of absolute poverty. I've given you the answer in the next video. Um, and some examples from Liberia, a country in Africa that has um, some issues with infrastructure, buildings and sewage systems and water treatment systems and, and uh, utility systems not being available for a huge population onslaught that they've had um, in Liberia because of war and famine and strife in the countryside with people flooding into the city, but uh, terrible poverty and death results from uh, the kind of conditions that they live in. So that's our next video to watch uh, for lesson two. Th this was lesson two, part two, and the next video will be lesson two, part three. So look for it in our Blackboard folder, and I will see you real soon. Stay healthy.